Hello and thanks for watching this week. I'm so excited because YouTube has sent me this awesome email showing us that we have gotten to 500 subscribers. Actually, we're a little bit over that by now. But as you can see, I'll put this in the video. Um, it says here that we are able to fill a jumbo jet. I think that is so exciting at this point because there's so many people out there that want to listen to the Word of God. And they want the simple version. They want the version of okay, what does God say, and who is God, and who is Jesus, and let me really see who these people are. I don't want an opinion from a preacher who submits to a 5013C, and trust me, we'll talk about that in the future, because I have doing some research on the 5013Cs and churches, so that is something coming up way in the future, um, but that's really who they submit to when they sign that document they're submitting over to the government and this is why we're having so many problems in our churches today I'm Lydia and I just read you the Word of God from my King James and I've done research on it I've done historical research sometimes I'll put pictures in this video I will put some pictures today of some of the things related to this so I hope you will watch and stay with us and really learn the Word of God. There's a lot of videos that you can watch. Um, today we are starting with the New Testament. I have done Genesis and I have done Exodus, um, the complete book. And now we are going into the New Testament because some of the people that are out there wanted me to do some stuff that's more related to our everyday life. I just want you to see that I have my Bible here open in front of me. But what I do now is I enter all of my notes from my Bible into my iPad because if not, I would have like 30 sticky notes on each page. It just makes it really hard for me to do this and I have to edit a lot because I lose my place a lot. So I don't have to edit as much when I'm using my iPad. Now I do edit this video because I want to make it as short as possible. I don't need you sitting there watching me fumbling with sticky notes and losing my place and stuff like that. So I do um, edit those things out. I also have my dog who always sits with me under the table and she um, actually has like a cough this week. So she's drinking water now, by the way. Um, so um you will hear her sometimes when she's sleeping she's today on. so we are going to begin with matthew there's so much great stuff that i learned in matthew this week things that i really am looking into because i'm taking it slow now with the bible before i read the bible and i'd highlight in the next chapter next chapter and i was tired and i come from work but now i'm really getting into it and i'm really doing the research and finding things out about the time and other things that I weren't, wasn't thinking about that lead me to know who these people are and, and what was happening at the time, which is so important for us. So I have myself a cup of coffee here because it's early in the morning. It's been raining a lot in the last couple of days. So I hope that you sit down, relax, and just let's listen to the Word of God. Let's get to it. I'm really excited because Matthew is a really big chapter. Let's get into the history of Matthew first. All right. So the book of Matthew... It starts off, and this is why it was chosen, because it starts off with the genealogy proving that Christ is the Messiah. The last book of the Old Testament was Malachi. 400 years passes by where we don't hear anything at all. So Matthew is the first book of the, gospel, of the Gospels of the New Testament. And what it, Matthew is is basically chosen um, because it is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And genealogy means that it's going to prove to us the lineage of Jesus from the Old Testament. Because remember, we were promised in the Old Testament, we were promised that the Messiah was coming, right? To be our Savior. So this is why Matthew was chosen as the first book, even though it was not the first book written, but it was really the first book that they decided to put in this genealogy. There's 46 well-organized names. They're just not scattered. They were put in order for, us for a reason. Back in the day, it was really important to keep a record of the lineage that goes to a royal bloodline. So I'm going to read from my notes here because there's so many notes here. There's no way that I can memorize all of this. So Matthew was also known as Levi. He was a tax collector. And it appears that he was Greek. And he was literate. And he was well organized. And some people even speculated that he was the recorder of the disciples. That he walked around with like a little piece of paper and a, like, well, not that bad day. But he was the one that wrote everything down because I don't think he walked around with a pad. I don't think people had no pads in the day. But he was the one that wrote all of the notes and of Jesus' teaching. He took the notes for the teaching. And um, 
wherever he went, he would compile the account of Jesus' teachings. So it's also noted that um, at that time, tax collectors were bitterly hated at the time because that was not a job that people usually wanted. So basically what he shows us in this genealogy is that Jesus was the son of David and it traces it sit all the way back to Abraham. And that's what he does later on in the gospel of Luke. And we'll talk about that in a second. There's a different version of it. And I'll, I'll explain to that for you. I'll explain that to you in a second. So in the Old Testament, God gives us the covenant of the coming Messiah. And he's going to redeem Israel. And he's going to leave the nation in peace. And that's what the Messiah is going to come. Because there's a covenant promise that he makes to the people. So now this New Testament is going to follow Jesus. Who he believes that he is the Messiah. And he's got to convince everybody that he is. That's basically what it is. Because in those days... People would never thought that a guy like this would have been a Messiah. And we'll talk about that later in the future. Jesus now has to convince people because he's got to change their perception of what the Messiah is coming and looks like. So he's going to challenge the way that they think about the Sabbath, the way about they, the way that they give, and about obedience, and also about the kingdom of heaven. All of those things he's coming to challenge the religious people. This story is going to tell us where Jesus comes from and it's going to be told kind of in the eyes of Joseph and that's really important to note here. All right let's get into it. Verse number one of Matthew of the New Testament. Verse number one, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. All right so I want to stop here because there's lots of notes that I have to read to you here. So we already talked about 400 years that passed since the Old Testament and the Jews were waiting for this Messiah that was going to come and save them. So when Jesus enters the world, the, the land of the Palestines was controlled by Rome and the presence of the Roman soldiers. And this gave the Jews military peace, but they were still oppressed because they were held in slavery and there was still injustice and immorality during the time and this is why the messiah had to come at this particular time because things were were getting a little out of hand at this point so the book of matthew begins showing us that jesus was the descendant of abraham the father of the jews and a direct descendant of david fulfilling the old testament prophecy of the line of the messiah genealogy is going to come up in the next couple of verses i'm not going to read all of the names because i want to try to get this video done in under 40 minutes i don't know because there's so many notes here but you will notice and we will talk about those um that some of the people in the genealogy had shady past and some of them were women okay and this is only going to show us that god's work is not limited by our sins and our failures he could still work through you even though you're a sinner and that's what he did here because tomorrow if you remember back she was one of them and He's going to work with ordinary people just like you and me. So we don't have to be perfect to be a disciple or a follower of Jesus Christ and come to him, to come to him as our savior. So he's going to accomplish his purpose no matter what, whether you're a sinner or not. He's going to have a purpose for you. He's going to get it done. And it doesn't matter if you're a sinner. So if you think that's going to hold you back and God is calling you for something, it's not going to hold you back because God doesn't care. He's going to choose you anyway, no matter what. So anyway, let's go down all the way to verse number six. And it says, so all of those between two and six, those are all just some names. Okay. And verse number six says, and Jesse beget David, the king and David, the king beget Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. So here we have mentioning David and Solomon, of course, because that's the royal bloodline there. And then we're going to go all the way to number 11, where it says, And Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. So I have some notes here about this. So Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and he conquered Judea, and he destroyed Jerusalem and took thousands of people captive. So this exile of Babylon happened around 586 B.C. All right. So let's go all the way down to number 16. 
verse number 16, and it says, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now, you have to be able to break down this verse. It's really important if you want to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So I'll give you some notes here. So Mary was a virgin when she became pre pregnant. So Matthew lists J Joseph as a husband, but not the father. So if you read this verse, it says, uh, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So Jesus was born of Mary, but it doesn't say she was born of Joseph. So that's important to note here. He's actually telling you that. So the, ge the genealogy in Matthew gives Jesus legal and royal lineage to Joseph through his adopted father. And that's what this Matthew, this whole Matthew lineage thing is. So this isn't a blood lineage of Jesus, but the legal in it. So legally, the, the, the bloodline through Joseph was legal. The bloodline through Mary, and we'll get to that when we do, I think, Luke. And yeah, it was going to be Luke to Joseph. And the Gospel of Luke shows the lineage, to the Jesus' blood lineage. Mary's line we talked about was going to be, is going to be recorded in Luke and uh, how it's a direct descendant of David. In this Matthew, it is made known that Joseph is not the father of Jesus, but he is the husband of Mary. So he is definitely legal with her. So in this book of Matthew, Matthew brings the lineage to Abraham. We talked about it, but Luke in his gospel, he's going to bring us all the way back to Adam so that through Adam, we are saved as Gentiles, not Jews. So you will see that coming up when we get to that book as well. All right, so let's go to verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. From my notes that I wrote that Matthew breaks down history of Israel into three sets of 14. And this is like a compressed version of the genealogy and not every generation was listed. There's way more than that because there's so many years that passed by. But he's only giving us specific genealogies because those are relevant to the Messiah. It's just kind of compressed version. So as you know, there's going to be, there would be pages and pages of more names here. Verse number 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now this is where it gets really interesting because I watched movies and I heard stories and I've heard preachers preach, but I really love all, the, all of the stuff that I'm learning here. So I want to share this with you. So to understand this verse, you have to understand what the, Jesus, what, the, what the Jewish marriage was about. And there were three basic steps that were involved. So the families had to agree on the marriage. So that was important. And then a public announcement was made. And then it became official that the couple were engaged. And even though there were no sexual relations at the time, so at this point, their relationship could only be broken by divorce. And, and this is really interesting. So stay with me. I'm going to show you. So the engagement was arranged by the parents. Then we get what is called the betrothal, which is official and binding. And this is where they get married, but they don't, they don't sleep together yet. Okay. So it's basically, it's like an engagement period where you are like with this person for a year. Then the marriage comes in after one year of betrothal. So it means that you're living together under the betrothal stage. You're living together, but you're not sleeping together. You can't sleep together till a year after. And so Joseph and Mary, basically at this point, they were living together. They were in the betrothal stage. They were not married yet. They were in the betrothal stage. And this is where the, the Holy Spirit came upon her and she became pregnant. So imagine this guy, he's living with this woman. He hasn't slept with her yet. And all of a sudden she's pregnant. <laughs> now at this point, he can divorce her if he wants because he has, this is the time frame for divorce. You can decide whether you want to be this person or not. So you'll see what's coming up. But remember, because she was pregnant and it wasn't from him, of course, um, 
at this point, she could be stoned and killed. But remember, he also loves her. So we're going to read all of that. It's so super exciting. This story is so awesome. It's just, I love hearing all this. So it's important to note that the virgin birth is important in the Christian faith because Jesus Christ was God's son and he had to be free from the simple nature and that was passed on to humans by, by Adam. Because Jesus was born of a woman, he was a human being, but as he was a son of God, so he didn't come from a man. Basically what this does is that Jesus has to come without any trace of sin. And that is why um, we know that he was human, but he was also divine. All right. And that's why he had to live as a man because he had to understand what our struggles, our experiences, and he was he will be able to connect with us to take us away from the power that sin has on our lives. So that's what he did for us coming as a human. And he's coming with the ability to help us. That's why we can reach out to him because he knows he was here. He has been a man and he understands all the things that we struggle with. Verse number 19, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. So this is important to note that Remember, he loved this woman. He was betrothed to her. And he's now finding himself in a situ situation where she's with child and he knows it's not his. And this is a bad thing during the betrothal because the betrothal is the time where you're not supposed to sleep together. You're supposed to wait a year. So now this is a spectacle in the town because now people are thinking they didn't honor the law. They're thinking that he slept with her. So he's he's ashamed that people are going to look bad on him, right? And she's probably as well. And she's probably a young girl too and didn't understand what happened to her. The Holy Spirit came to her. So let's go on. In Joseph's mind, there was only two options, okay? So one of the options was he could divorce her quietly. That was an option. Or he can also have her stone. Those were the options that he had basically here. But God gave him a third option. And sometimes that happens in our life. When we're struggling and we think there's only two options, all of a sudden a breakthrough will come with an idea that maybe God leads you to a sermon, a television show, a podcast, a radio, and just something clicks in your mind and gives you the idea. And it sparks that idea that comes from God that you didn't think about that there's another way out. And in this case, this is what happens. What we have to do in moments like that where we're caught in the very difficult decision um, that's hurtful, especially to others, is we really need to get down and pray and ask God to give us revelation and wisdom on a situation. In this story, it helps to know that God's guidance is what helped Joseph make the right decision. To, so what Joseph did, and we'll read it coming up now, was he, he chose to obey the angels. And we'll see that coming up now. So verse number 20, but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So the conception of this birth now Joseph knows is supernatural this was a supernatural event the old testament and the new testament is covered in angels okay so don't come here and tell me that there's no angels because obviously there are they're all over the book and the angels were created by god to help carry out his work on the earth and brings god's messages to the people they also guide us and they also are sent to encourage us but they also protect god's people and we've seen that with the pillar and cloud in Exodus. and But they're also here to carry out certain punishments that we deserve. And they also patrol the earth. And they fight the forces of evil in the spiritual realm for us. But remember that like they're good angels sent from God. There's also bad angels that are not of God. They have less power and authority over us because remember once you have the blood of jesus christ they don't have any authority over you because jesus won and defeated them because remember that jesus christ won during his resurrection 
he beat them. The angels, what they were really set out to do is really constantly, they're always praising God. This is, this is what their role is. This is why in this verse, if you look here, in verse number 20, it says, saying, Joseph, thou son of David. So he is proving, the angel is proving to Joseph the lineage that Joseph has through David. That's what he's proving here. And that's really significant for Joseph to get it. Because you imagine, you don't know if it's a dream. You don't know what's going on here. But this lineage was so important for him to remind him of the lineage. So also notice that Mary had never told Joseph that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Because she was young. She was still a child. I mean, not baby, baby. She's probably 16 or 17, I would think. In those days, a lot of these women were, were were betrothed early in life. So she didn't really tell him anything. And now all of these things are being confirmed by the angel. And this is why he gets it. And this is to persuade him. Verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins so now this angel is declaring that this child was conceived by the Holy Spirit and the word Jesus means the Lord saves so he's confirming all of this and this is what he is coming to do for all of us he's going to be our Savior and he's also confirming the prophecy of Isaiah in Chapter 7, verse 14, where he is called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And we're going to see that coming up in the next couple of verses. And so, of course, this angel is also, you know, reiterating to him what the job of this Messiah is going to be, which is he's going to be our Savior. So let's go to verse 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, verse 23, behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And that's exactly what we talked about in my notes. Verse 24, then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. So now uh, Joseph understood the plans of God and he proceeded to marry her. And even though I want you just to know this life, nobody knew what was going on. Only these two people knew. So I'm sure he told her eventually, but they had to live with the public shame of all the people thinking that they had slept together. They couldn't wait. They didn't follow the law or they could have thought that she had this child with somebody else. So there was always this speculation in the town. The reputation was not that great. Just think about that. Because just because he married her, they didn't do the things the way they were supposed to. So that's where that gossip could come in. All right, let's go to verse 25. And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. So as you can see during the betrothal stage, um, he, 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 he did that and then he married her when it was time to marry her, but he did not sleep with her until after the baby was born. So it was very significant that he did that. Now we're going to go into chapter two of Matthew. It says, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Hera, the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. So I'm going to post some pictures here during this chapter, which is going to be significant for you to get a get of an idea because we're all so accustomed to the story that's fed to us during Christmas time with the wise men. So I want, to, I want you to make sure that you understand this. So I'm going to read from my notes now. Bethlehem was a small town and it was about five miles south of Jerusalem. And it's, it sat on a high ridge over 2,000 feet above sea level. And if you go to the book of Luke, it's going to explain why they were in Bethlehem and that Jesus was born there rather than in Nazareth, their hometown. But we will see the, the birth of Jesus will be explained further over there. All right. So let's go to verse number two. 
saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. We don't really know how many wise men there were, but we know that there were three of a high position. And as you can see in this picture, you see the three that they're leading the crowd. Not many people know why they knew that the star represented the Messiah. We still don't know them. There are speculations that these Jews were in Babylon after the exile and they knew of the Old Testament predictions. Or the other one is that they could have been Eastern astronomers who studied the ancient manuscript from around the world and they could have come from the East because of that. So they also, they may have had a special message from God directing them to the Messiah. And you will see later on further in Matthew that God speaks to them. So it could have been a message that they received. We don't know this. These men were kind of like a representation of the whole world celebrating and bowing down to the, to the worship of this Messiah. And that's what is represented here. Verse number three, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. So let's talk about Herod, Herod because he is some character. So we know from this that Herod was not a kind person just from the fact that all Jerusalem was troubled because of the news that he got. So the reason that Herod was disturbed when he heard about the newborn king was because he was not the rightful heir of the throne of David. And he knew that the trouble would arise if the rightful heir showed up. So he was suspicious that he would be overthrown. So if you notice in this verse right away that, and I thought it was a good a reference to this, was that when Jesus came into the world, it made people uncomfortable. This is the very first thing that we hear from the, from the message. Some people reacted to his presence with discomfort. And it disturbed them. And this is what you're going to get if you're a follower of Christ and you talk to people about Christ like I do. Some people are disturbed that I talk to them about. And this is the same thing that you're seeing with Herod here. Because they're illegitimate. You understand? And until you come to Christ, you are not going to be legitimate. Verse number four. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together... He demanded of them where Christ should be born. From my notes, I wrote that Herod, Herod inquired of the people in his own office and they quoted him. So he, he they quoted him from Micah chapter five, verse two about the Messiah. So he was frantic. Imagine he was like, I've got to know, I've got to know, I've got to know the truth. So he inquired of his people in the office. He could have inquired of astrologers magicians all of this super wicked type witchcraft type people and they also went into the books and they looked through the manuscripts and they were going to tell him the truth so this is why jerusalem was troubled because he made a big deal out of this even with the people that he was surrounded with so the scripture told them that he would be born in bethlehem we're talking about jesus and he would be the ruler who will shepherd the people of israel and this is what they had to tell him. Can you imagine these people having to tell this wicked man? Because Herod was really, I mean, Herod was evil. You'll, we'll talk about that in a few moments. But these people were troubled when they had to give him all this news. Verse number five. And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Verse number six. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. This is a shock and a blow to Hera. So many expected to believe the Messiah would come as a great military and political deliverer, just like Alexander the Great. And even Herod's counselors probably told him this. They didn't know the way that Jesus was coming. They just probably thought he was like some kind of an amazing military power, right? So this is why Herod was ruthless and took his chances and ordered all the babies in Bethlehem killed because he thought this was going to be some superpower guy that was going to come in with armies and just like battle them and get rid of them and get rid of him. And his legacy, his lineage with his children down the line were not going to be able to be the kings anymore. Verse number seven, then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, 
inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. So now Herod doing this kind of secretly away because now he's scheming something. He doesn't want the people in his court to kind of know what he's conjuring up, right? That's why it says privily called the wise men. So he inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. So he was troubled. You can tell that he wanted to know about the star. So the, the wise men were considered astronomers and the stars showed up at the birth of Jesus. So they probably told him it was like a year ago that the star, because it takes time to travel all of these miles. So they've been following this for a while now. Verse number eight, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. So this is him talking to the wise men. So obviously we know that Herod was lying and his plan was for them to reveal where the child was so he can kill this child. So verse number nine reads, when they had heard the king, they departed and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. They heard the king, but they didn't consent to returning to the king. And that might be why the star disappeared for a while. Because if you read this verse, it almost eludes. And we'll talk between 9 and 10. It gives you the feeling that the star disappeared for a while. And that was probably God was protecting the child because Herod could have sent somebody to follow them and that might have been why the star disappeared so we'll read this again number nine reads when they had heard the king they departed and lo the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the child was verse number 10 when they saw the star they rejoiced with exceeding joy so when they saw the star, it, it alludes to the fact that the star had disappeared for a while until it came upon the child. So they were in the direction following where the star had been all of this time. But eventually the star went away. So probably the men, it got far and far and far. And they just, I'm assuming that this could have happened. This is why they, 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 they were rejoicing because the star finally showed where the child was born. And verse number 11 and when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Cannot skip this part of the verse, okay? Notice how they worship the child because he was born a king. Usually, when a child is born, you don't worship a child like that. Because the child that is born to a king is does not born a king. He is born to a lineage. He is not born a king. He has to become king once the father gives him the throne, right? But this shows that from the very birth, because of the lineage, the, ro the, the royal bloodline, he was already declared a king. Do you understand? That's really interesting when you open that up and you understand that. Also estimated that the child by now was probably around two years old when the wise men found him. And by this time, Mary and Joseph were already married. They were probably living in some house in Bethlehem. And they were intending probably to stay there and raise the child. And we'll, we'll learn about this part of the story in Luke. In chapter 2, verse 39, there's more explanation of all that there. So let's continue. So also from this verse, we know that it was common to bring gifts to royalty. And these gifts were going to be a symbol of Christ's identity and what he would accomplish. And I thought this was really interesting when I researched my notes. So he was given gold. That was the gift for royalty. And he was also given frankincense, was a gift for deity, and it's also a gift for uh, considered like for the divine. Then he was also given myrrh. And if you go back to, I think it was in, I think it was in Genesis, we read about myrrh as a spice that was used to anoint people for burial. 
So as you can see, those were the three things that represented Jesus Christ as the Savior. And as you notice here also that when they gave these gifts to Jesus, they didn't hand them to the child who was two years old, because obviously the child at two years old is not going to know how to manage this stuff, right? What they did was they gave it to the parents. The parents were going to be managing these gifts that were for the child. So that's just to show you that a lot of times when we give to Jesus, we have people who are representing him, who we give the money to, and they are in charge of using that in the manner that God directs them and leads them to. So that's just showing you that as well. Verse number 12, And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. So they went a whole different way. They didn't go back to Herod because they were warned by God. So you see, these people had a connection with God. And this is why we said in the beginning when they went out, we don't know how they knew, but we they have, might have received, received a dream or a vision or something from God. These wise men, from my notes I wrote, they were warned by God not to return to Jerusalem uh, like they were asked, and they, they obeyed God. They obeyed God rather than Herod. They were not going to be Herod's informants. So there's a lesson that I thought was interesting from this part of the story here where it says, when you find Jesus, your life might take a detour because it's going to take you through a path where you're more obedient to God's word. And in that path, you might lose friends. And you'll see that coming up because you'll see what, the, what happens to Mary and Jesus. But you might have to leave your home. You might have to leave the area that you live in because you're walking in obedience. And sometimes God will show you that where you are is not where you should be in order to be obedient to him. All right, verse number 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. All right, so it's important to know, read the notes here, because this is such a great story. So this is going to be the second dream or vision that Joseph received from God. And this one was going to tell him how to protect the life of this child. And because he was the legal father, he wasn't the blood father, but he was a legal father. He was responsible for the safety and well-being of his family and this child. This was his purpose. He knew this purpose of his calling. And because his heart was the receptive to God's guidance, he understood what his purpose was here, was to protect this child. Another lesson that I learned from this also was that, uh, that Jesus came in a very innocent form into the world. And he was hated since that time, right? He was hated Herod and Probably a lot of the people that followed Herod also hated him because he was causing all of this commotion. And just the same way, he is hated today. Like you can say Jesus and people would just like look at you or you can't say this or you can't say that or they'll look at you like you're crazy because that is where we are in the world. They're trying to make Jesus a bad word or they're trying to make you seem like you're judgmental because you believe in Jesus that's what our society is doing, which is basically the same thing of uh, what was happening back in the day. Like, this is a bad thing. Jesus is a bad thing. And what they're trying to do with this is they're trying to murder Jesus in our hearts and in our eyes. So we don't talk about him. We don't spread the word. That's exactly what happened back in the day. All right, let's read to chapter 14. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. So Joseph was swift in his obedience to God by leaving as soon as he got the message. He didn't even wait. Going back to Egypt was not unusual because there were several colonies of Jews um, in several of ma the major cities in Egypt. So that's why he was going back there. So another thing that was noted in this section here, I thought it was interesting from my notes, was that in Egypt's history, the Jews left Egypt as an infant nation. And now they, Jesus was returning as a child coming back to Egypt to save the people. So they left us an infant, but now this child is coming into Egypt to save them in the future. I thought that was so interesting. Verse number 15, and was there until the death of Herod. 
that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Verse number 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So notice here how he realized he was mocked. Remember, the wise men went the total other way. They didn't return back the way they were coming because they didn't want to be questioned. They didn't want to be the informants of Herod. And they could have been killed as well. Most likely they would have been killed. So when he realized that they didn't come back, this man got angry. I mean, he had a temper problem. So he ended up killing all of the boys under two years old in an attempt to kill Jesus. He thought could have been one of them. But remember that divine appointments are part of God's plan. And those are not going to be thwarted by the enemy. Never. Because when God says this is going to happen, he is going to protect his purpose every single time. All right, let's go on to verse number 17. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy, the prophet, saying, verse number 18, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. So Rachel, if you go back to Genesis, was considered the mother of a nation. That was what she was considered. And she was known... And it was known as the great mourning of Israel's mothers. Back in Jeremiah 31, 15, that, that portion was mentioned there uh, from the prophet. Uh, verse number 19. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. For my notes, I wrote that Herod died in 4 BC of an incurable disease and Rome trusted him, but they didn't trust his sons. So because Herod knew that Rome wouldn't give his successors, successors much power, he decided to divide his kingdom into three parts to give one to each of his sons. So this is why it's important for you to know this, because in the next verse, we will understand why. So the next one says, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead, which sought the young child's life. And he didn't ask of God, well, when am I going to get a job there? Well, are we going to have the money for this? Or how am I going to leave everything behind? He just did what he was out to do. And I will say this, and I didn't read that in the notes here. I must have skipped it. But the gifts that the, the wise men gave them could have also um, funded the trip. Those gifts of the gold... The gifts of the frankincense and myrrh. Frankincense and the myrrh were very expensive uh, oils that people would pay money for. So this could have been a way, some kind of like uh, monetary that this would pay for their trip moving forward. Verse 21. So he, so he didn't have to question God because God has been providing all along for them. Verse 21. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. Verse 22. But when he heard that... Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod. He was afraid to go hit thither. Notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. So let's learn about this. This Archelaus was a really evil person. This king murdered 3,000 influential people nine years later, and God banished him. But during this time, God didn't want him, didn't want Joseph's family near this evil ruler. So this is why when they were headed that way, they moved over to Galilee. So notice here that this was, it's where it says here, being warned of God in a dream. This was another dream that Joseph got from God. And in this area was Syria, of, it was called Syria of Galilee, had more Gentile populations than in Judea or Jerusalem. So that's why they moved in with the Gentiles people. Verse 23, and, it, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called Nazarene. All right. It's important to note this because I did not note this, that the people of Nazareth, the original, this was original hometown of Mary, but it could have been divided into sections. Um, this area of Nazareth was really a place where um, it came in contact with people who were traveling through all over the world. 
So this was a town where news got to them quickly. So that could be why they were moved here so that they would know if, you know, somebody was coming in and it was a small town and the most of the people were considered low, uncultured and not very smart in this little town. But remember that Mary and Joseph had strange circumstances with the birth of this child. And this was her, like her hometown. So she already had a reputation. So this is why um, the reputation of this family wasn't too great coming back here. So imagine they had to withstand all of this coming back to this area. So this is basically where Jesus is going to grow up. And then later on, Joseph, for some reason, we don't hear about him anymore in the scriptures because we don't hear any more of Joseph. We know that Jesus ends up being the man of the family because that's what the sons usually do. Um, he would, he worked, he supported the family. He loved God. He provided and he proved that he was faithful in small things before he ended, he entered the ministry. And I'm going to link it below this very interesting um, blog post. It's by Arthur Blessed. And if you remember him, he used to be on TV and I used to walk around with the cross. So I thought it was so interesting because I did research. And then I'm going to clip for you here to show you the distance between all of these places. Now, when you read these stories, you also have to take into account how long it takes for one to walk from, um, let's say, from Nazareth to Jerusalem or to Bethlehem. All of these places take, I mean, it could take a year. It could take two years walking. So this gives us an idea of who Jesus was and why he understood the wilderness the things that he learned growing up, he had to learn how to live in the desert. Sometimes the weather was like 120 degrees. They were walking for days. They were sleeping in the desert. They were dealing with storms during the winter time. There were some parts of the desert that were extremely cold. When you read these stories, it's important to know all of the things that make him stronger. All of the things that he had to endure in life. Because we're not going to hear a lot about him until his ministry. So we're going to have this lapse of time. But remember, a lot of this time was he was walking. He was walking three times a year to Jerusalem for the feast that he had to attend as a male. And this happened sometimes twice a year. He had to go to different feasts and he had to walk all the way back. Now, most people in the day would bring a donkey with them to put their supplies on the donkey. But they were walking. They were walking all of these miles. And when you hear the story of Mary, when she had birth, when she had the child already, remember, she was probably walking also with this child in hand during all this time when they were moving about. So I thought that was all really interesting um, for us to understand today. So with that, I thank you so much for watching. This has been super exciting. I'm loving, loving, loving getting to the Testament, really understanding the times of Jesus. And he paid the penalty for our sins. He gave us the power to remove the sin so we're not doing it anymore and we don't want the presence of our sin in our life anymore that's what jesus does so he he takes away the sin he gives us the power to control the sin in our life and then he also gives us the presence to not have the sin anymore because we are present in his life we are present under the blood of jesus christ and i ask you today to go to jesus christ if you are a sinful person if you've done sin, sin sinning just means that you missed the mark and we miss the mark daily in our lives we're all sinners because every single day we might have a thought that we shouldn't have had we might invent a plan we might tell a white lie we might do different things that are of the world but we really have to try to walk with God so we don't do those things it's really important but remember that that presence that you have in your life is going to keep you from lying it's going to keep you from making up stories it's going to keep you from um, doing the things that the rest of the world does because you have the spirit of Jesus in your heart so I thank you so much for watching so please call on him to open your heart to receive him that's all you have to do is just say look I don't know. I'm just, I'm going to receive you in my heart. Walk in faith and he will do the rest for you. So stay tuned next week for chapter three and four of the New Testament. 
and I hope that you all have a wonderful week. God bless all of you. Bye-bye. <coughs> the things you don't see, people are filming. I spilled coffee on my table. Oh, gosh. Ah.